anybody tells you that they've predicted what's happening in La Liga, they're not from this planet. Or they've got a magic crystal ball. Either way, don't believe them. In this film, we're examining the great overachievers of La Liga this season, Girona. Recently promoted, we'll explain how they're going for the league and how it could spell doom for global football. Girona is the second city of Catalonia and is housed within its walls are a shade under 100,000 people who live between the shores of Costa Brava and the region's capital, Barcelona. If people from Girona were previously to indulge in football, they'd either support the club from the Camp Nou or even Espanyol. Until recently, Girona was more famous for being a filming location for Game of Thrones, which I'm told is supposed to be quite popular. Since that series' perfect and critically renowned finale, though, things have changed. People have actually started paying attention to football more local to Girona. But why? This is an unglamorous club away from the traditional riches of the capital. This is a club who, thanks to La Liga's salary limits, run in the same dizzying financial circles as Cadiz, Alaves and Granada. They're allowed to spend 700 million euro less than Real Madrid, but this season they are title rivals. If Real Madrid are the city traders of Canary Wharf, Girona are the penniless buskers in Camden Town. The Monte Levi has only recently began to be filled to its 14,000 capacity. Copper coins and plastic buttons compared to the globally wired transactions of a spaceship-like 10-figure renovation on the Bernabeu. Girona should not be here, and I don't mean in the title race. They should be nowhere near La Liga. Their histories and traditions belie the club's current situation. First off, they were a club founded at one of the most inopportune times in Spanish history. At the start of a decade called the 1930s, that would end brutally with the Civil War. So just when Girona's new freshness could have triggered a momentum, football was culled and what could have been a blossoming club was trampled on. Instead, the heritage of Girona lies in tiers 3 and 4 of the national game. We've even brief spells spent in the fifth tier in the 1982-83 campaign and between 1997 and as late as 99. Before you go crying Luton Town, it is worth pointing out that most countries aren't blessed with the same pyramid. Clubs simply aren't as upwardly mobile outside of England, and there isn't as rich a culture if you drill beneath the glossy surfaces of the top tier or even the second tier. For example, Girona were playing in front of just 200 supporters on a good day in the fifth tier of Spanish football. The English equivalent's smallest ground currently belongs to Oxford City, who, whilst currently rooted to the foot of the National League, pull in an average attendance five times that of Girona's during their spell in the fifth tier. So, Girona's promotions from Tier 5 to La Liga isn't commensurate to Luton Town's successes of the past 15 years. It would be akin to a team currently playing in the South West Peninsula League Premier Division East of Tier 10, challenging Manchester City for the Premier League title. So if you find yourself a fan of Clompton Rangers, Axminster Town or Stoke Gabriel Torbe Police FC, get excited, this could be you in 20 years time. Back to Girona. Their rise through the divisions back to the Segunda for the first time in half a century meant a return to professionalism. It took just nine years. Whilst they treaded water for a while, staying afloat in the Segunda, Ramon Villaro's purchase of the club changed its fortunes. Or so they thought. They were suddenly on course to become a top half Segunda division club and were one game away from the esteemed turf of La Liga in 2013. Unfortunately, they lost to Almeria 4-0 on aggregate, a team who are currently attempting to obliterate the record for the worst points tally in Europe's five biggest leagues. The subsequent campaign was one of stagnation. Girona were crippled by an accumulation of over 3 million euros worth of debt, something which remains a mere snack for the more risk-taking second-tier clubs of England. 
they would be saved, but it was a nerve-shredding time for what was still a small gaggle of fans who could attribute themselves as die-hard Girona supporters. They were saved and by a man with quite the distinct surname in Catalonia. Agent, businessman and everyone's favourite Catalan brother, Per Guardiola, changed Girona's trajectory. He was the man brokering a deal between the club and TVSE Football of France, and he quickly became the public-facing figure as chairman. He was the one who solidified the club from the top down. Long before the marriage between Girona and Manchester City under the Church of City Football Group, their flirtations in the transfer market gave the club a decent footing to go again in the Segunda playoffs. It was only a matter of time before they were promoted, right? Not right. And that was despite their position as blatant frontrunners to be promoted on the final day of the 2014-15 season. The visitors to Montalivi on the final day were Lugo, your basic second-tier bottom feeder. Imagining an English equivalent takes me to a Rotherham United or even a Bristol City. They're never going to threaten a promotion race. They should be beaten at home and simply exist to reside in the same division, to bar ill-fitting upstarts or to aid an upwardly mobile unit into the big time. To give you an idea, in their most recent 11 season spell in the Segunda, Lugo have finished no higher than ninth. Except Lugo did not want to play ball on the final day of the 2014-15 campaign and pissed everybody off at the Montalivi by scoring an 89th minute equaliser. Still, the safety net of the playoffs was there, until it wasn't when Real Zaragoza pipped Girona to the final on away goals. But this was a team on the up. How many times it happened that a championship club has been defeated in a one playoff campaign only to come up via the same means the year after? Aston Villa and Brentford are recent case studies in England and are currently successful top tier clubs. But this was Girona, comparison to a Leeds United suits them more in that they are utterly phobic to the whole concept of the playoff. So in 2016 they go one better but lose both home and away to Osasuna before clearly feeling so spooked out by the prospects of a fourth playoff devastation in five years that they escape the division via automatic promotion in 2017. They'd received a bit of a leg up, admittedly, but that was to become a full-on embrace as Girona had finally become a La Liga club. August 2017, the month where Girona's very existence changed, but not how you would imagine when they were swallowed up by the City Football Group. 44% or all of TVSE's shares were bought by the footballing conglomerate that has fingers in the pies of clubs like Melbourne City, Mumbai City, New York City, Montevideo City Talk, Twa, Lomel, Shenzhen Peng City, Yokohama Marinos, Palermo and Bahia, as well as, of course, Manchester City. It is the English club that Girona had lent on before. Manchester City, far before the appointment of Pear's little-known brother Pep as manager, had had ties to Catalonia. Once they had soothed their own excitement of holding the salivating combination of a seemingly unlimited amount of money and absolutely no restraint, the club relaxed into a watertight structure. This saw to the hierarchical acquisitions of Ferran Soriano and Tiski Bergeristein. With an upwardly mobile Catalan club in Girona doing quite well for themselves at the same time under more and more power under Pere Guardiola, their path simply had to cross in the transfer market. After the marriage to CFG, that was ratcheted up a notch. Girona welcomed the likes of Alex Garcia, Marlos Moreno, Douglas Luiz and Pablo Maffeo in the space of one season, after their previous dalances with City in the shape of Florian Lejeune, Angelino and Pablo Mari. One of the quite abundantly clear positives to being entrenched as a feeder school underneath a gigantic institution is the ability to pluck some of the best and brightest young players for little to no financial weight. Girona had been doing this for quite some time prior to promotion, only now they had unlocked even more benefits, like some multi-million dollar Patreon account. Girona now had access to the same scouting models they basked underneath the glow of City's pull and could use both their expertise and, during pre-season, their facilities to their advantage. 
Their first term in the big time was an impressive top half finish, which was inclusive of a win over the fucking reigning European champions, Real Madrid. However, they'd be quickly found out under some unfortunate circumstances when losing nine of their last ten matches, which plummeted them into the relegation zone despite a record which read close to a point per game. Over time, as they tried to juggle their return to the Segunda with a crippling global pandemic as well as a constant roulette wheel of departures, Girona changed tact. They became more prescriptive in the loans they acquired from other CFG clubs and would utilise the likes of Yankuta, Pablo Moreno and Yangel Herrera over many loan periods. Meanwhile, Tati Castellanos of New York City and Savio of Troyes became crucial in recent times. This, though, neglects to mention the loss Girona had to suffer. Players of quality like Yasin Bono or Pedro Porro are always a handful of good performances away from being plucked from them. Bono famously found what he was looking for at Sevilla, whilst a key negative of the agreement with City Football Group saw Pedro Porro taken from them and signed for the parent club at the Etihad. The same agreement has taken place with City for Savio, and a transfer will be completed between the two for the winger this summer. So Girona were back in the Segunda, and what that immediately entailed were yet more brushes with the playoffs. In the elongated 2019-20 season, owing to Covid, Girona lost an elongated two-legged final to Elche, who netted the only goal of the tie in the 96th minute at the Monte Levi. The sour cocktail of a pandemic and a lack of a bouncing straight back to a more lucrative La Liga forced the sporting director Kike Carcel to change tact. The new philosophy demanded they bring the wage bill down, of course, this would be aided by CFG, but they would be more selective in taking on loans from other clubs in the system, ensuring they got the correct player, hence the multiple loan terms for several players. In the Segunda, their fortunes mirrored the time they were pulled from the brink by Pep Guardiola, and what that meant was a constant stream of the dreaded playoff campaign. Baked into round two of these games of Russian roulette was an air of momentum to Girona's play. They wouldn't start their final two Segunda seasons in the best of light and found themselves needing to cobble together an impressive feat of results just to qualify for the playoffs. It might have benefited them in 2021 had they not come up against Andoni Iraola and his spectacular Rayo Vallecano side. Despite their calibre, Girona chalked up a first leg triumph at the Vallecas, only to go down at home themselves, only to a bigger scoreline which kept them in the division. They didn't look far from the capital, and specifically Rayo Vallecano, for the manager who would eventually take them back into La Liga. Michel was practically royalty at Vallejas, as he played over 350 league games for Rayo and was the man before Iraola to have achieved promotion at the club. In fact, Michel was kind of the reverse Sam Allardyce of the 2010s. Whilst the Englishman sold his reputation on almost exclusively fighting fires in the bottom half of the top flight, Michel was quickly becoming renowned for taking clubs out of the second tier and into La Liga only with the distinction of never seeing through a full La Liga campaign for himself. He might have made Rayo Vallecano champions of the second flight, but found himself sacked in March 2019 in his first season as a La Liga manager. Rayo were comfortably housed in the relegation zone and would get relegated after his sacking regardless. Not content with that, he returned to the Segunda with his next job and got Huesca up once again as champions, only to last even less time in the top flight than before. He was relieved of his duties in January with the club rock bottom. They too would cease to be a La Liga club come the end of the season. From his opening 10 fixtures, it didn't appear as though Girona would even have the fleeting benefit of a La Liga holiday. The club had won just two from Michel's opening 10 matches and were occupying the drop zone. Here is where perhaps the best positive of being part of the City Football Group kicked in. It was their analytics that kept hold of the manager, as they pointed towards the fact that the manager was likely doing a better job than the results suggested. Gradually came the reward. Just as a prior season, Girona surged into the playoffs once again, which was only narrowly secured thanks to their head-to-head -head record ahead of Real Oviedo. 
the playoffs proved six time lucky. After a win over Ibar after extra time in the semi finals and a 3 1 win away to Tenerife in the final second leg. And yet, Michel appeared to be experiencing the same top tier travails as he had done at Rayo and at Huesca. They found themselves in the La Liga drop zone as late as spooky season. But Girona remained patient, clutching at their Manchester City endorsed analytics and artificial intelligence. Most importantly, they kept their swashbuckling style of football. They pulled their noses up and after enjoying another great second half of the season, squeezed into a challenge for the European spots. Successive triumphs over Real Madrid, Sevilla and Mallorca found Girona within the European places in seventh. Then, at a direct opposite of their prior two seasons, they ran out of steam. Two points from their final five games, as well as an early failure in the Copa del Rey, meant no European football. Only now can we say it proved a blessing in disguise. Girona didn't perform like a normal newly promoted team in the 2022-23 season of La Liga. Their defensive record was only worse than the bottom four, which is somewhat commensurate of a newbie to a top league in Europe. However, only four of the top five in the division had scored more than them. The question was, ahead of the 2023-24 campaign, would they be able to replicate their fearlessness or even correct some of their faults? They have plundered the highest amount of goals in La Liga thus far, with 57 at the time of writing, suggesting that they have retained their efficacy in front of goal. However, their 32 conceded remains one of the worst in the top half. It suggests little has changed, so why are they suddenly in the mix for the league title? What makes these numbers frightening for the rivals around them is that yet another raft of players were torn from them yet again. Tati Castellanos' loan from New York City was ended and he was swiftly sold to Serie A club Lazio, whilst Rodrigo Riquelme's loan from Atletico also concluded. Yet more key figures were gone for good in the shape of Oriol Romeo to Barcelona and Santi Bueno to Wolves. Girona spent the summer with their backs against the wall, as usual. Yangel Herrera, one of their longer-term loans from CFG, was turned permanent for the lowly sum of 5 million euros. Whilst another avenue was tapped up for the loans of Pablo Torre and Eric Garcia, as Barcelona at least afforded them something for stealing Romeo. The free market was plumbed for Fulham reserve goalkeeper Paolo Gazaniga and Bayern Munich's Daily Blind. Other people's trash became Girona's treasure. Meanwhile, the cut price transactions for Hetafe's Porto and Villarreal's Ivan Martin, as well as Atletico Nacional's John Solis, filled out the squad. Completing that squad was the breaking of Girona's transfer record. Don't get pressing the sports washing panic button just yet, however. Artem Dovbik, a player who was signed off the back of 24 goals in 30 Ukrainian league games, was acquired for just 8 million euro. While Savio was acquired on a loan from a CFG club, it was from Ligue 2's Trois and for what was ultimately an unfavoured player. These players are not world beaters and this is not the gaming of a system or being overly reliant on a multi-club ownership model. This is merely shrewdness. It is a team that has been cobbled together for less than 35 million euro, the sixth lowest in La Liga. You could call it a team full of rejects. At the heart of the team is a spectacularly a Girona reject as Alex Garcia returned in 2021. He had hardly pulled up any trees at the club in his first spell between 2017 and 2019, but he had bounced back since and was retrieved from Dinamo Bucharest. He is now the kingpin of the midfield after moving back into more of a number six position. It is a team built on partnerships as any good teams are. Daily Blind, usually deployed at left centre back, is paramount to how Michel wishes to set Girona up. He's highly versatile and more than willing to shuffle over to left-back to cover for the adventurous inverted wing-back of Miguel Gutierrez. Gutierrez can be found in the opposition box or he can be found patrolling out of possession alongside Alex Garcia in more of a number six position. On the other side, Jan Kuto has established a welcome partnership with Ukrainian winger Viktor Zyankov on the right. 
Signed last January, Zankov has rapidly become one of the more exciting players in La Liga. The headlines, however, have been grabbed by his compatriot Dovbik. Before Girona, he was perhaps most famous for scoring a Ukrainian winner at Hamden Park against Sweden in the last 16 of a European Championship match. A few years removed from that, Dovbik is Girona's top scorer, snaps at the heels of Jude Bellingham's goal-scoring pace in the league and is one of the more prolific strikers in the entire continent. He remains the rigid landmark up top in what is usually a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1. Even though he is getting on a bit and doesn't start most matches, Christian Stuani compliments Dovbik perfectly. Stuani is another diamond found in the rough of a patchy goal-scoring record for both Espanyol and Middlesbrough, and the wrong side of 30. However, he has maintained a record of a goal every other game across well over 200 appearances for Girona. His achievement of scoring double figures in each of his seasons at the Montalivi has continued into this campaign. Meanwhile, on the left, Savio is one of the more tantalising prospects in this Girona team. Previously disused at Troyes and riddled by injuries at PSV Eindhoven, Savio is often left isolated on the left, but it is entirely by design. It allows him a free run at a solitary defender or a one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper, and this tactic has been reaffirmed with Savio's brilliance either in front of goal or assisting colleagues. He ranks behind only Leroy Sané, Bukayo Saka, Ilkay Gundogan and Alex Grimaldo for expected assists in Europe's top five leagues. It is this leave perhaps taken from the book of Fluminense coach and Fernando Denis that has allowed Girona to flourish. This take on anti-positional football of the Brazilian has doubled down on the company-wide preference to lay in quote-unquote crosses before a back post finish. That has been made famous, of course, by Pep Guardiola and Manchester City. In fact, Girona score from more quote-unquote crosses than most, but this is merely because a pass into the box from outside it from a wide area is defined across. You will rarely find a bulleted header from a burly centre half, but an intricate piece of work flooding one half of the pitch before a switch, usually from close range to find the opposition's net. Interchangeable and fluid in possession, out of it, Michel has his team drilled into a narrow mid-block that affords support for wide defenders. This must not be underestimated when taking into account the improvements made to their defensive records. Their expected goals against per game has decreased to 1.4 this season, whilst their clean sheet percentage has drastically risen from 10% to 34%. Meanwhile, they've not only retained their incredible attacking displays, but have vastly bettered themselves going forward. Their XG per game is up from 1.33 to 1.71. Their expected goal difference has gone from a negative to plus 8 in La Liga. They've also netted three or more goals in 10 La Liga games, up from five for the entirety of the prior season. Girona's season got going at speed as they began to steal the show three matches in, with a terrific 2-1 win on the road against Europa League champions Sevilla. It was arguably one of Savio's first great showings for Girona as Alex Garcia snatched a winner. The goal frenzies previously seen in the prior year returned with a 4-2 beating of Granada and a 5-3 home victory against Mallorca before a triumph over Villarreal propelled Girona to the top of La Liga for the very first time. The run wouldn't end there. They became the first team outside of the big three of Real, Barcelona and Atletico to win 11 of their first 13 La Liga games. Their only loss in this time frame came against the former when an informed Jude Bellingham helped sink Girona in a 3-0 win for Los Blancos. It merely acted as a blip. Just two points were dropped in the next nine matches, as if the sporting director had set all the players' current ability to 200 in football manager. The sweetest win of the lot came away to Barcelona on December the 10th and can only be described as a footballing lesson. It is no exaggeration to say that they've ruined Xavi's team. They maybe even helped start the fast-tracking of his demise in the managerial hot seat in the Catalan capital. Four goals were put beyond them in showing that the Catalans were outright leaders of the league and one of the best La Liga teams ever after 16 matches. 
this usually reserved for the team in Catalonia. Now it was the preserve of little old Girona. Still, they did not stop. A month later, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Atletico Madrid and an in-form hat-trick scoring Alvaro Morata and were able to take them the distance. The game won 4-3. Girona went right to the last whistle by winning the game in second half stoppage time. It goes to show just how gutsy Girona are. They have gained more points from losing positions than any team in Europe's top five leagues, with 22. Then, Sevilla were slapped yet again, this time hitting five goals beyond them. This included a six-minute hat-trick for the main man Dovbik up front, which were his 12th, 13th and 14th goals of the season. And it got people quite rightly thinking, what if Girona won La Liga? As the giants of Spanish football were schlepped from one side of the continent to the other or were embroiled in the Copa del Rey, Girona had a mere dozen games to go in La Liga and the majority of them were winnable. Also sooner, Hatafe Betis were dropped without much thought. A point was won at the Metropolitano before the double was completed over Barcelona, as well as Cadiz, Alaves and Villarreal all beaten. The only blemishes, draws away at Las Palmas and Valencia, which left history beckoning on the final day of the season. Girona welcomed Granada, already relegated, whilst Real Madrid welcomed Real Betis to the Bernabeu a week before a date with Wembley. One point separated the sides. Girona's 4-1 triumph rendered the whole spectacle in Madrid useless, even if they did win a record extending 15th European title. All it did was to place both Girona and Real Madrid in pot one ahead of the new Champions League format. Receiving two opponents from each pot, no game was going to be easy for Girona. From the challenges of Liverpool and Paris Saint-Germain in pot one, Leipzig and Arsenal in pot two, or the quadrant of Atalanta, Red Star Belgrade, Nice and Celtic from the lower reaches of the draw. All done without Michel, who was busy coaching Barcelona against Milan in their Champions League opener. It mattered little, as the Ukrainian partnership of Zagankov and Dovbik was untouched by suitors around Europe and the pair converged on six of the club's 17 goals throughout the group phase. Celtic were humbled 5-2 at the Montalivi, whilst five goals were shipped against both Leipzig and Atalanta, but Girona crucially received a point from each game. Importantly, they wouldn't have to travel to Belgrade, but have the Serbians of Red Star come to Catalonia, and that proved the difference. Dovbik's four-goal haul confirmed Girona's spot inside of the top 24, before defeats against Liverpool, PSG and Arsenal, either side of Christmas. A very un-Girona-like 1-0 win on the road against Nice, however, wasn't enough to catapult Girona into the top eight. In this convoluted format, Girona were granted another chance, but they would need a playoff to qualify for the last 16. Seeded, they were handed the advantage of the Montalivi in the second leg against Porto. By the time the sides lined up in Catalonia, most of the Iberian Peninsula was glued to the television screen. Porto had scored three at the Dragao and was still left bereft thanks to Girona's four goals on the road. They just had to hold their nerve at home. It didn't appear they'd be back as they placed all their energies into the winter months of the Champions League and occupied ninth place by the time a memorable 1-1 draw was acquired in front of 14,000 people against Porto. It ought to have been a moment to celebrate, but the moment their opponents were picked out of the hat was the moment that it all came crashing down. Not in a footballing sense, even if they were comprehensively plunged out of the tournament in a 6-3 aggregate defeat. More so from a morality standpoint, as Girona were paired off with CFG pals Manchester City. It opened up the proverbial can of worms that UEFA couldn't do anything about, and although both teams quite clearly tried their utmost to win, it made almost everybody feel uneasy. If Girona were to be ahead with five minutes left, what was to stop Manchester City pulling out their Uno reverse card and demanding the Spaniards give the game up? What's pride with billions of pounds to play for?
Unfortunately, Real Madrid appear to steal a march on regaining their La Liga crown by performing the double over Girona at the start of February. Their 4-0 victory for Los Blancos opened up a five-point gap between Real and Girona, and as good as Girona have been, perhaps this is the beginning of the end to their title bid. Not that it should be a downside to their season whatsoever. The aim, as always, is to tentatively achieve survival in such a great division, and Girona effectively did so inside of a dozen games. They've all but assured themselves of a European place for the very first time in their existence, and will surely qualify for the Champions League, especially if Spain are to grab one of the two extra coefficient spots. The bullet point here should be, who cares if they won't win La Liga? The Girona story remains an incredible one, regardless of the outcome now. Whatever happens, they've achieved their record high finish and have done so against all the odds. Odds that we've probably not seen since Leicester City in the 2015-16 season. And of course, the easy comparison to make is between Girona's class of 2024 and Leicester City's Dilly Ding Dilly Dong 5000 to 1 fairy tale. But they're of course not one of the same bottle. For one, Leicester City were propped up by a ludicrously inflated television rights package that, after just one season of survival in the Premier League, effectively made them one of the richest clubs in the world automatically. Girona won't be able to achieve such a status unless they spend a decade punching drastically above their weight and perhaps win the league or routinely participate in the Champions League. And it's not quite realistic in the grand scheme of things, unfortunately. You could make the argument that Girona have propped up by something a little bit more nefarious, City Football Group. At the time of writing, they own three other European football clubs. Who knows, by the time this goes out, that may well have increased. But for now, the European stable includes Girona, as well as Troyes, Lomel and Palermo. All are majority owned by CFG and all sit at 95% or higher, except for Girona. Although it should be said that Per Guardiola retains a lot of influence at the Montalivi, effectively inflating the CFG control from the actual 47% number they physically own shares in. Of these three clubs, Palermo were the least reliant on handouts from CFG, whilst Trois and Lomel in comfortably less reputable leagues can be found further down the food chain of the organisation. Trois have donated plenty of City loanees and below them, Lomel are accepting of the French club's cast-offs. Lomel and Palermo are likely to be coming to a top flight near you soon. Lomel are entrenched in the promotion pitch in the second tier of the Belgian league, whilst Palermo currently occupy a playoff spot in Serie B. Whilst Trois are currently engaged in a battle not to be relegated from Ligue 2, they had spent the first two years of their CFG ownership in Ligue 1. Whether or not transfers are free to travel with little to no friction around the ownership is your bone of contention, the sharing of knowledge, expertise and methods is likely to be enough for each and every club to be successful eventually. This, for better or worse, is a facet of football in the 21st century. Multi-club ownerships in football are presumably here to stay and now will not be stopped. Red Bull were the original blueprint after all and their ownership of their primary clubs in Leipzig and Salzburg as well as in New York and in Brazil. Then you've got their incessant talent swapping by Udinese and Watford via the medium of Gianpaolo Pozzo who owns both. Todd Bowley, cumbersome as ever at Chelsea, threw his hat into the ring by owning Strasbourg too. Just as Sir Jim Ratcliffe has got a stake in both Nice and Manchester United. Not that any media outlets report on that one. Some might not bat an eyelid at it. Others will decry the whole thing as a sham and feel uneasy about it. Perhaps because it is Manchester City, who are front and centre of this particular club ownership, they receive extra scrutiny. And maybe rightly so, they have been charged 115 times by the Premier League, were taken to court by UEFA and there will forever linger a sense of uneasiness about the way football changed for the worse the minute Sheikh Mansour sunk his bottomless well of cash into the Eastlands of Manchester. Should this be enough to rail against Sharona? For some, the fact that they play attractive football is not enough. They'll cry sports washing. For others, it won't matter that they've not blown the bank to acquire a pool of players that are effectively cast-offs. The horse, unfortunately, has already bolted the cat out of that damn bag. It has been ruled for all to see that governing bodies are powerless to stop the behemoths that own football clubs now, either in the courtrooms around the world or in 
increasingly on the field of play. After all, as soon as it was ruled legal for Red Bull clubs to play against one another in Europe, the tidal wave has followed, with a loophole that resembles a gaping open Sunday League defence, the exploitations have been performed and there is no going back. The fear remains, will we reach a total point of perversion in football? Will Girona, Palermo and Manchester City soon make up the latter stages of the Champions League or potential Super League? And if so, what could possibly be done to stop it? For now we're some way from that, but it remains possible. <laughs>